bringing a baby into the world. It all begins with the birds and the bees. Except when it doesn't. Fertility innovation has come a long way since the introduction of in vitro fertilization. Now, things like artificial intelligence and cutting edge techniques are helping make the dream of a family become a reality. Okay. When this couple in Maple Ridge, British Columbia began thinking of having a child, they knew they had some big biological hurdles to overcome. The cheapest thing possible. <laughs> Stephen was a widower with two grown children. Erica had no children of her own. How long has it been since we've had to go? When the pandemic hit, they started prioritizing what was important to them. I realized that it was something I still really wanted, wanted to see if Steve would be open to that, and it was a lot of conversations. Um, yeah, yeah, it took a long time, yeah. Yeah, we yep. went to see a counselor yep. um, to talk things through, and, and through that really was, was helpful in a lot of ways. It was hard. It was really hard was on it? our relationship. That's why I asked you about, like, meds. Like, My main concern is that uh, I'm 60 now, and I need to stay healthy. Thank you so much. That's excellent. And Erica, in her 40s, knew she wasn't the ideal candidate for pregnancy. I'm older, my eggs are older, um, so there was that that played into it too. This wasn't a guarantee. After deciding they were ready to go for it, Hi there. Erica and Stephen met with Dr. Sonia Kashup, director of Genesis Fertility in Vancouver, a leading West Coast clinic that helps people conceive. The natural pregnancy rates at age 40 are about 6% per month, compared to at age 30, which are about 20% per month. To improve Erica's odds, she was given medication to stimulate her ovaries. I took the injections for 10 days to try and get as many eggs as we could, and we were hoping for 10, but there was only four. Stephen also needed some help. Steve had a vasectomy 20 years ago, so if we were going to do this, it would have to be very purposeful. Sperm doesn't really age. Not very at all. <laughs> so in order to use his sperm, you have to go through a procedure to extract the sperm. If you can't do a vasectomy reversal, which usually after about seven years, you can't. To retrieve Stephen's sperm, they sought the help of Dr. Ryan Flanagan. He's an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia and founder of the Flanagan Fertility Clinic in Vancouver. So what specifically does your clinic do? My subspecialty is in infertility and sexual medicine. So I'll see couples with all forms of infertility and I treat the, the male side of things. Stephen had healthy, detectable sperm, but because of his vasectomy, Dr. Flanagan had to use a process called PESA, or percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration to retrieve it. Did you two even know that all these things were possible before you started your journey? Because of this, it was an extraction um, and not yeah. just a regular sample of sperm, they actually injected the, the egg with the sperm, right? So they find a sperm that looks the best and they actually inject it right into the egg. Oh, I see. Um, so it's a bit of a different procedure than, right. than just the regular IVF. So we didn't know that that was possible. The fertility tech boom started in 1978 with in vitro fertilization. The eggs are sucked out through a needle inserted in the abdomen. Where egg and sperm are united outside of the womb, then implanted in the uterus. Science has taken off in the decades since with the ability to freeze eggs, retrieve sperm and detect healthy embryos. But there's always room for more innovation. So what are the biggest challenges that your patients face? Is it things like low sperm count? Yeah, low sperm count uh, can often be some of the most challenging things to overcome. And when there is no detectable sperm, what do you do? When we don't see any sperm, most often it's a, a failure to produce sperm within the testicle. Um, when we're in this scenario, the most common direction of treatment if we're trying to get that individual sperm is to do a, a microsurgical procedure called microtessy, where essentially we're looking inside the testicle using a microscope to try to find rare areas of sperm production mm -hmm. that could then be used with IVF. Microtessy differs from PESA, the procedure Stephen had, because it involves taking a tissue sample that a clinician then searches through for active sperm. When we do these biopsies during the microtessy procedure, we may be collecting tens of millions of cells, and we're asking them to find tens to hundreds of sperm in order to uh, facilitate an IVF uh, round. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack on a microscopic level. They will literally search for hours under a microscope 
where they're trying to use their eye to distinguish amongst hundreds of cells in a field to try to find this single sperm sometimes uh, where they may not find a, a sperm for hundreds of thousands of fields when they're searching through. How often do they find the viable sperm in a case like this? It's about 50% of the time. Dr. Flanagan believes there's a better way using AI. So we have been working on trying to create a technology where we're using artificial intelligence to train an algorithm to identify a sperm uh, amongst all these millions of other types of cells. So how much would this change things for couples wanting to conceive? We're hoping that a, a greater percentage than the current 50% of couples would be able to have sperm identified. Toronto fertility specialist Dr. Dan Nayot is also using AI to increase the odds of conception, but his focus is on eggs. As it stands now, the human eye is not capable of confirming the quality of an egg. Although we've tried to visually score eggs for decades now, there hasn't been a validated evaluation system. We believe machine learning could unlock this mystery. By feeding a computer program thousands of pictures of eggs and correlating them to successful pregnancies, he believes they can more accurately predict which eggs will become the best candidates for making babies. We've had a lot of interest from around the world. We're already uh, in several clinics in North America and Europe. It is a counseling tool. What we're doing with our AI is personalizing that feedback and is to say, yes, you're 36 years old and you have 10 eggs, but when we've analyzed each egg, this is our personal prediction of what we think your chances of success are. That's really important information because perhaps she should do another cycle or a third cycle to get more eggs. Because when she comes back in the future, and if it does not work, she may not have this opportunity again. This is your ovary on the right side. And this is but that wasn't an option Erica explored. When they ovulate on their own, they're often bigger than when we trigger them. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because of her age and the cost of the fertility treatment she was already undergoing, she was only prepared to give it one shot. And we feel very lucky that we were able to pay for it once. A lot of people are not able to pay for it at all. Yeah. Um, so we feel fortunate in, in that respect, but it, it is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. May I ask how much it is? Oh yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think it was twenty five. It cost us all about twenty five thousand. Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. Yeah. So yeah, I actually paid for someone to put needles in the testicles just to draw out some sperm. You know? Yeah. So we were yeah. like, we're just going to do this once. If this doesn't work, yeah. I'm going to have to be okay with with not having kids, and I I resigned to that. Three embryos were implanted in Erica's uterus, essentially putting all the couple's eggs in one basket. Yeah, it's normal. And 10 days later, a positive pregnancy test, one of many. I took yes. so many pregnancy tests. Yes. Like every just, day? Yeah, I kept taking them because I just, I, I, I did believe it, but it just seemed so surreal, you know, and for something that I didn't think that I was going to have. Yeah. It was just like I, I, I wanted to hold on to that excitement. And nine months later, Elliot arrived. Oh dear. Hi. Hi. Oh, hello. Okay. Hi. Hi, buddy. Yeah. Will you tell him the story of how he came to be when he gets older? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe it was something that was a stigma, you know, way back when, but I think these days it's just becoming more and more the norm. Are you watching Rosie? Are you watching her? Genesis gives you a picture of the embryos when, right before they put them in. So when they're, you know, three days old and right before they, they put them back in my uterus, you know, these, this little clump of cells. And so I have this picture of these three embryos and one of those is him. <laughs> and that's how cool is that to be able to show him and say like, that was you. Like that's, that's the earliest baby picture you can possibly have. Yeah, right? and most of us don't get that. <laughs> no, no, most of it is in the hospital or maybe an ultrasound. I think he'll like the story. I think it's a really cool story.